It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Mary Shaw. Um, any of you who have a rough idea who, uh, who Mary Shaw is uh, will realize that there's no way that I could do her background justice. So I think the best way for me to talk about this is um, how I came to know Mary. Um, I went to Carnegie Mellon and uh, I uh, started as a, um, I was relatively old, I was in my 30s when I started the program. And uh, I thought I knew quite a bit about software at that point. Maybe some of you think you know quite a bit about software. Uh, anyone who meets Mary realizes you don't know nearly as much as you thought you did. Uh, I, I was exposed through her to the foundational papers in uh, computer science and in software engineering. Uh, I learned how to be a better writer about software. And uh, in general, she is, has had a huge impact on uh, my ability to build software and to talk about it and understand it. Uh, and for that, I, I thank you, Mary. So without any further ado, uh, Mary Shaw, and here to talk about, uh, uh, what is the topic you're talking about? Uh, <laughs> Some, they're slides. She's going to talk about those. <laughs> okay, am, am I mic'd? Uh, am I projecting to the house? Does this mic project to the house? No. Uh, it says it's on. I have a green light here and uh, no volume, right? Okay. <clears throat> Plan B. Now. Well, it might take a second. I just turned it back on. Now? Yes, okay, I got it. I'm looking at a blank screen here. Now we're in business. OK, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you, George, for not telling all the other stories. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to get to Saturn at last, because uh, you've been trying to get me here for a while, I think. Uh, I guess what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is software engineering as an engineering discipline, uh, which is something that has fascinated me for a very long time. And this seemed like a good opportunity to, to stand back and ask again the question, um, is software engineering really engineering? So what I'm going to do um, is, is ask, what does it mean to have an engineering discipline for software? Uh, which I'm going to do by starting with uh, engineering, engineering and trying to get a fix on what it means to be an engineering discipline. Uh, then ask what it would mean to have an engineering discipline for software and ask how far we have come toward that goal and what we have to do next. I'm going to take this, the examples from civil engineering and uh, principally from software architecture. So uh, 20 years or so ago, I had a chance to uh, uh, take a sabbatical. I read a lot of history of engineering because at that time I said, okay, we're calling it engineering. What, what should that look like? And one of the things I learned while reading the history of engineering literature is that you know, everybody has a little bit different definition. But if you take all the definitions of engineering and pile them in a heap um, and kind of squint, uh, you'll see that they have these things in common. Uh, so they'll say engineering uh, is about creating cost-effective solutions, yep, got that, to practical problems, that is, problems that people care about, got that, uh, by applying scientific knowledge, building things, um, and they almost all have a term about in the service of mankind. Uh, and the idea is that uh, engineering um, doesn't replace virtuosity, but engineering allows the rest of us to do things that might otherwise require virtuosos. And since there's a scarce supply of virtuosos, it's nice if the rest of us can, can participate. Uh, but there's one, one thing about this definition that bothered me, and, and that's scientific here. This creates the image that engineers apply the science, and if there isn't science, then what? Uh, but in fact, um, what engineers do is apply the best available, organized, codified knowledge that they have available. And if they've got scientific knowledge, that's kind of the gold standard. But if, if they don't have concrete science that allows them to do mathematical computations about the, uh, the stresses and so forth, 
Then they'll drop back to um, empirical data, um, experience, uh, prior projects of the same kind, and eventually to engineering judgment, um, and not to just guessing and cobbling it together. So I think it's important to understand that nuance of, about the classic definition of engineering, because otherwise we get stuck on, is that science? And if it's not science, that's not engineering. And, and that's, that's a dead end. Uh, so the characteristics of engineering and engineering practice are that your practical problems are over-constrained. Uh, you have limited time, you have limited knowledge, you have limited resources, and this forces you to make design decisions that trade off one against the other, because the only thing you can do to make progress in an over-constrained system is to do trade-offs. Um, as I just said, they exercise the best, best organized knowledge available. Uh, to do that, they rely heavily on reference materials to make that knowledge and experience available. And one of, the character, one of the key characteristics of engineering is that they can analyze at the design stage um, and make a prediction about what the product will do once they have built it. And that, that ability to look at the design and anticipate what the consequences of the design decision will be, especially in this trade-off space, um, is a very important part of engineering. So the way engineering disciplines uh, emerge um, is you often begin with some kind of technology that's exercised as craft. Uh, think community barn raisings, uh, where there's, there's shared knowledge that there's not particularly experts, there's no specific training, um, it's often for local use, uh, but you get the job done. Um, at some point, the technology becomes sufficiently significant that you need um, um, better management, better organization. Maybe you need to, uh, to get resources up front before you can sell the product and, and recover the costs. And so you need management and production expertise. And those two things come together, the, the management skills and the technology, to produce a, a commercial practice um, that uh, gets the product in people's hands, that, that makes profits for the, the people who are producing the product. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you run up against ob obstacles in making the, 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 pro the products work. This often feeds the creation of a science. Certainly, chemistry got started this way. We're trying to understand the pragmatic problems um, of, of production. Uh, so, so a science often gets started by trying to answer the, the practical questions that commercial practice is running into. And then there's a dialogue between, between science and practice um, in which science feeds responses down and practice feeds new problems up. And when those two uh, fuse so that, that, that science generally is producing enough organized knowledge uh, to refine the practice, that's when you see the, the, the practice of software engineering. So I'm going to take this pattern and use it to try to trace the, the development first of civil engineering um, and then of software engineering and software architecture. Um, so I've just said this, engineering emerges out, emerges out of craft and commerce requiring, it's nice to have scientific foundations, but at least systematically codified organized knowledge. Um, and to exploit technology, you need both. You need management and you also need the technical knowledge. Um, and uh, science draws on practice and, and progressively grows out of practice uh, in many cases. Um, so if we take civil engineering, and in particular, bridges and arches, uh, uh, back when the world was young, uh, <clears throat> spans were, were covered in ways that you can imagine being motivated by things that actually happened by accident in nature. Um, in the first century, uh, the Romans built a series of, of bridges and aqueducts. Uh, they, were, they were functional, they were chunky, there was extravagant use of materials, and one of the things that you see about them is that if you, if you look carefully, you can see where they were building along. They had a failure, they repaired the failure, they retrofitted uh, back to what they'd already done, and they incorporated that change in the ongoing design. So you can see a very kind of pragmatic uh, uh, growth of knowledge. Um, so they made uh, empirical progress uh, by noticing what failed and, and what worked when they repaired it. Uh, there's not much evidence that the Romans deliberately applied mathematics to determine the sizes or shapes of things. Uh, they didn't have very much theory, but they developed pragmatically construction methods that lasted well into the 19th century. Uh, the definitive manual of the time is called uh, The Seven Books of Architecture by Vitruvius, 
Um, it's uh, hmm, about half an inch thick. Um, and it tells you all kinds of practical things like how to build a wall where it's uh, stone-faced and rubble inside, uh, how to tune an amphitheater with bronze pots so that you get good sound, um, how to organize the streets of your town so that the evil miasmas from the local swamp do not sink in the natives. Um, it's just a broad-ranging documentation of the sorts of, the sorts of things they knew and did. And it's wonderful reading. So as time passed, uh, bridges became uh, lacier. Uh, the, the round arches uh, thinned out into parabolic arches. The spans rose. Uh, the area underneath the bridge increased. Uh, there are a number of different measures you can use, but, but the bridges got, got more ambitious so that they did more bridging with less materials. And you can see a little bit of that progress here, um, still with stone arch bridges. Then by along about the 15th century, uh, without any kind of formal mathematical models, uh, they could say, well, gee, here's my rule of thumb. I use the following proportions in my bridges. And just let me parse this picture here. Uh, that's the foundations in the river bottom. That's the river itself, and that's the bridge deck. So that, that looks more like a bridge now. Um, and you can see that, that I, <clears throat> um, Alberti says, uh, well, you, you, you take the height, and as a fraction of the height, here's how big you make the other stuff. Um, then in the uh, mid-18th century, um, they introduced cast iron as a substitute for stone. And as often happens when you introduce a new technology, the old architecture was mimicked. Um, so this is the uh, uh, iron bridge at Colebrookdale in England that was built in 1779. It's still standing. They only let pedestrians on it now. But when you look at the bridge, you can see the classic stone arch architecture um, and how they cast uh, units that were sort of shaped like stones and lashed them together. So they took an original design into a new material. Um, cast iron then became uh, the material uh, of choice, not for all bridges, but for many bridges, and particularly railroad bridges. And uh, a century later, uh, the uh, cast iron bridges started collapsing. So the the one that people finger as the major disaster was uh, in 1847, the D Bridge failed. Um, and <clears throat> the reason this is a signal event is that there had just been formed a commission on the investigation of such things, and so the, the Queen caused an investigation. And the investigation reported out uh, metal fatigue. Um, so the bridges were failing when they had trains on them, and you can understand this because when there's a train on, the stresses are higher. And so trains were falling through bridges. This was a bad thing. Uh, the Royal Commission held an investigation, uh, and what they found was that cast iron is really not a very good material to build bridges out of. It's good in compression, it's not good in tension, um, and in the middle of the span, when you're weighting it and it's flexing, that winds up in tension, uh, and they break. So this pushed, uh, pushed the technology over to wrought iron and eventually to steel, uh, where you have better performance in tension. Uh, so the, the Commercial practice of bridges uh, involved increasingly long, longer spans and lighter structures, uh, some rules of thumb about proportions, um, explanations of structures, and the introduction of new materials. Uh, then, where, where does the science come from? Well, in, in civil engineering, the fundamental problems are the composition of forces. I mean, we all think about vector composition of forces, no big deal. They didn't. They had trouble understanding exactly what the concept of force was that should be represented by such a vector if they even knew how to represent a vector. Um, so they, they dealt with the composition of forces and they dealt with bending. Um, late 18th, 17th, and early 18th centuries were the points at which these theories emerged, um, and they needed new mathematics. That's, that's when we got calculus at about that time. And the, uh, the mark of the advent of engineering analysis to bridges was the Britannia Bridge um, in the mid-19th century. Uh, it was a through-truss bridge, that is, the train drove through that, that rectangular box. And uh, that was analyzed and built. And you'll see from the sketch that there was a plan B. Those towers were designed to hold suspension cables in the event that the bridge got into trouble. Um, so that brings us to the uh, turn of the 20th century. This is a couple of pages from the, uh, the first uh, Iron and Steel Handbook. Um, you're not intended to read all those elements, but you can see that there's tabulations where you have the cross sections of beams in various dimensions and then formulas that tell you properties. 
So this kind of tabulation of properties is, um, is not much more than a century old. Then by the mid 20th century, you could have a textbook on uh, bridge superstructures uh, that says, here are some typical superstructures of bridges, and now here is a, a chart that tells you how uh, one, uh, one, one measure of that bridge is related to a, a coefficient of some property that you might care about. Um, and I, I hold on to this as an example of the kind of organized knowledge that engineers have. This is a theory that explains a property of bridges. They've got a lot of this, and we don't have very much. Um, so we saw theories developing uh, through the mid-20th century, and the current state of the art in bridge design um, is that you now turn the crank. So in Pennsylvania, for simple bridges, uh, simple single-span bridges, uh, the PennDOT requires you to use this particular suite of, of CAD tools that takes you from problem definition through the drawings that you hand to the engineers. Um, it handles concrete steel bridges with spans of 18 to 200 feet. Um, it lives at that location, and here's a couple of, of images from the software itself. Um, so you get to choose the type of abutment and the type of superstructure, um, and, and then it turns the crank and produces the drawings that, that say the bridge looks like this. And the last time I looked, they were still marked, this has to be signed off by a real engineer, uh, but, but the whole drawing package was there. So from, from piling up stones to, uh, to automation in you know, merely a couple of thousand years. So civil engineering, uh, I'd mark the, the key moments um, as the Romans in the first century bringing together uh, management with craft in order to hold a, an empire together. Um, the science uh, running from 1700 with statics through 1775 with hydraulics. Hydraulics is just harder than statics because it doesn't stand still. Uh, and uh, professional engineering starting sometime between 1750 when they were annotating properties of materials to 1850 with a full analysis of a bridge. So you see there was a, a certain amount of passage of time and gathering of experience uh, that went on there. Well, things move faster now, so uh, we should be looking at decades rather than centuries, but, but bear in mind that it does take time. So what about software engineering? Well, the first question is always, <clears throat> should it be engineering at all? And here's our definition of engineering, and I put it to you that software engineering looks a lot like this. We are interested in cost-effective solutions, uh, we're interested in practical problems, we um, Mostly, I think, believe that we can accomplish that by applying things that we have studied and learned, uh, rather than by starting from scratch and scratching our heads. Uh, we build things, uh, and um, um, I don't see any problem with maintaining the service of Mantine Clause. I think that's actually a pretty good idea. Um, so we'll take software engineering to be the branch of computer science that creates cost-effective solutions to practical computing problems uh, by applying codified knowledge, developing software systems in the service of mankind. There's a couple of things to note. <clears throat> One is that in comparison to the engineering of things, um, software is different because the manufacturing costs are a minuscule fraction of the cost of the, of, of, of the thing. The cost is all upfront in design. So people sometimes map engineering to software by saying the coding activity is like the construction of the bridge. That's wrong, that gets you into trouble. Uh, the coding activity is more like handing the 20% designs to the draftsman and saying fill in the details so that we will have a set of drawings that we can hand to the people who are actually going to put the rivets in the bridge. So be careful about the analogy. The analogy works when you recognize that, that coding is, is, is the detailed end of design um, and that manufacturing used to be pressing CDs and putting them in shrink wrap boxes, and now it's pushing stuff into an electronic deployment chain. Uh, the second big difference is that software is symbolic and abstract, and it's constrained more by its intellectual complexity than it is by fundamental physical laws. I mean, yeah, we do have fundamental limits, uh, but, but they're not right up in our face in the same way that, that the theory of statics is in the face of somebody building a bridge. So. Um, I say uh, software engineering ought to be engineering, and let's go find out how we're, how we're doing it, getting there. 
well, the term was coined in 1968 as a rallying cry. Uh, NATO convened a conference of uh, distinguished software developers to, to talk about what are all the problems with software development. And uh, there's a litany of complaints out of this book that I could throw up here and you would say, yeah, 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 got that. <clears throat> That's still true. So it was coined as an aspiration, not as an actual description. Um, and at that time in 1968, there, we were building software. We had built some really great software. Uh, the Sage Air Defense System was a virtuoso performance. It was built by actual engineers, and it was a virtuoso performance, not a representative of the state of the art. Uh, so what, what you actually see in 1968 is monolithic development, um, merging research development and production all, all, in, all in one, uh, one uh, task. Uh, the software actually worked fine in some areas, but certainly not for life-critical applications. Uh, there were complaints about a widening gap between our ambitions and our achievements. Uh, software was, guess what, <coughs> late, overestimate, and not meeting specifications. Um, and uh, there was too much revolution and not enough evolution. That is, too many people trying to be creative rather than building on things that had gone before. So an example, uh, just to be concrete about what they were complaining about, here is one of the diagrams from that report. Um, it's a schematic for the total programming process. And the, the important thing here is that it says the traditional concepts of programming cover that pink bit called implementation, but in practice, programmers have duties all, ranging all the way from uh, problem recognition to obsolescence. Um, and <clears throat> so the complaint was that they were intensely focused on one piece of the entire process. Um, okay, no big surprises there. So then we turn to, uh, to production techniques. <laughs> Up, up in this corner of the life cycle. Um, and in the 1970s to the 1990s, there was an enormous amount of activity about systematic software development methods uh, that in one way or another brought order and predictability to project management. Uh, and there is, there is a list of, of some of the examples. Uh, many of you have been involved in, in that. Um, this brought us to the ability to manage the, the, the projects, but it didn't particularly address uh, the science of, uh, that, that underlies the technology. Um, so we didn't, we didn't start from scratch. Uh, we, we certainly started with a lot that we had inherited from, uh, from other branches of computer science, data structures, algorithms, programming languages. Um, all of this is part of the well-understood knowledge toolkit. You know, I shouldn't have to say that, but people tend not to remember those things when we talk about is there any organized knowledge. Um, and then uh, we have developed, uh, in, often in response to, uh, to practical problems, verification, model checking. Um, we're limited in, 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 our limits are often described by computability and, and, and the effects of scaling. Um, and we have, uh, you know, objects, uh, canonical structures for many applications. Uh, we've developed software architecture, model-based engineering, pattern languages. Um, all of these are, are part of the codified knowledge of software engineering. Um, and it's not just that we have a bunch of particular techniques. Uh, you can think about uh, a science in terms of the way it thinks about what problems are important and what approaches it you take to them. And so I want to call out not only some of the particular results, but the, the point of view that drives us. Um, you know, abstraction is our tool for controlling complexity. We impose structure on problems. We remember the common solutions when we try to make them canonical and distribute them as such. That, that's what pattern languages are about. Um, we know that our bread and butter is symbolic representations of things. Uh, we, we thirst for analysis and prediction, even if we don't always achieve it. Um, and we know that exponential growth limits us. So we, we have sort of core beliefs like that, that that guide the way we develop the science. And um, the science is often stimulated by problems in commercial practice. I think I probably don't need to dwell on this for this audience, uh, so I will just throw them up there as examples. And research gives back. Um, this is a part of a diagram that, that shows how research feeds practice. I know it's not legible, so let's blow up just a bit of it. Um, 
the red lines are research done in the university, the blue lines are industry R&D, uh, the black dashed lines are products, and the green lines are billion dollar markets. So without worrying about the particular examples, you, you can see that there is flow um, and cross flow um, where, where the science and the practice are interacting. Now for me, the development of software engineering can be tracked by an increase in the size of the chunks that we don't look inside of. So we'll call this an in increasing abstraction scale. In 1950s, the big deal was, was using macros or maybe subroutines. Um, and now we have uh, uh, domain platforms, uh, cloud architectures, uh, and, and tools to handle things in between. So as, as, we, as we learn things, we, we bundle them up inside our tools. And this bundling up of knowledge inside tools is one of the ways we transmit the knowledge. Um, and then our, our aspirations grow bigger and bigger. And I want, I want to go back to that, uh, that picture of uh, bridge superstructures and, uh, and, and figuring out the properties that those would have. Um, I really, really wish that we had more explicit design decision guidance. The best piece I know dates from 1971. Um, it's from a computing surveys paper on sorting. Yeah, the, the details are obsolete, forget that. The important thing is the structure. If you want to choose an algorithm for your problem for sorting, um, again, you can't see it all, uh, but you can see, um, you know, is CPU space time important? Yes, uh, yes use a tournament sort uh, on two disks. Yes, uh, interleave the strings. No, and then we're down to six tape poly tape polyphase merge. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't care about seven tape polyphase merge anymore, but I care a lot about our shortage of design guidance that pulls together the things we know and says, all things considered, here is a decision tree that lets you work through your problem. Now, what about software architecture? Um, well, you all know this. Um, software architecture involves principled understanding of the large-scale structure of software systems um, with lots of details. As, a, as an organized discipline, it emerged in the 90s from, from informal roots, uh, and those informal roots are the vocabulary that people were already using to talk about their systems. Uh, in the 1980s, people would write a paper about a system. There would be six column inches called the architecture of my system with four column inches of prose that used words without any particular definition and two column inches of box and line diagrams with yes boxes and yes lines, uh, but no, not keys. Um, and software architecture began by trying to, uh, to extract that vocabulary and organize it uh, so that people could use it more consistently um, and provides guidance for making explicit design choices. So there have been architectures forever. Uh, this is from Conway's 1963 uh, uh, paper on a compiler organization. Uh, you can see the data flow flowing there. And there was actually a program transformation in that paper uh, that told you uh, how, to, how to substitute a, a tape for passing something along in core. Um, and then <coughs> box and line diagrams became the, uh, the medium of expression. Here is a, a multics diagram. And if you look at it carefully, uh, you can see that there are things called rings. Uh, and there are actually layers in this system although they didn't describe it as a layered system, they drew it intuitively in such a way those layers showed up. Uh, so that has been craft practice. Software has always had a structure. Um, there's been an informal vocabulary. Uh, that vocabulary came with intuitions and folklore and, and, and software architecture has, has had the task of drawing those intuitions and folklore out uh, and making them concrete. Um, there are ancient examples, but then we move on through the 80s with various sorts of diagrams, boxes and lines, or boxes and not lines. Um, this is a redrawing of the A7. Um, and um, that was the state of practice through about 1990. So what we got was an informal vocabulary stimulating the development of a more rigorous vocabulary, uh, the need to communicate an architecture to other people in a project leading to notations in architecture description languages, um, ad hoc analysis giving way to some style specific analysis that I'll mention in a moment. Multiple versions um, uh, and, and version control chaos leading, among other things, to, uh, to product lines where that, that 
the systematic variation was, was embedded in the definition of the system. Um, and maintenance issues, particularly code rot, leading to a, a sensibility about architecture as high-level documentation. And gosh, you all know this. Here are some sample idioms or styles or patterns. Um, we started out calling them styles. I'm, I'm cool with calling them patterns, which seems to be the, the current trend. And what you find now is online tutorials uh, that say, um, for practitioners, here's an explanation of an interior architecture. Here's an explanation of a virtual machine. And the important thing here is that th these are not diagrams of a system. These are templates that are being presented in tutorial for someone to use to instantiate a particular system. And that, that's a step up from just ad hoc drawing a diagram that suits you. So commercial practice moved from batch processing to informal use of the word architecture uh, to structure and product lines um, into architecture research actually entering practice, often in the form of company-specific overall architectures frameworks, um, UML, uh, for better or for worse, and in its day, um, and objects everywhere. So now I want to look a little more closely at, at the science and at the maturation of, uh, of software architecture as a, a research discipline. Um, Redwine and Riddle, uh, back in the mid-'80s, uh, looking at the, the business of, of technology development and maturation and transition, um, wrote a paper in which they captured what they learned by, by looking at that experience. It said, here's how scientific ideas mature. Um, they begin with uh, basic research uh, on a problem and the spinning off on other ideas. There's sometimes a key idea that you can point at and say, that, that's the seminal idea. Um, it gets refined. It comes out in a the publication. There's a seminal paper or maybe a seminal system. Um, you know, who, who knows the citation for the paper on Unix? I mean, answer almost nobody. It was Unix that was carrying the ideas of Unix, not any piece of writing about it. It was Unix itself with your hands on. So the, the idea may be carried not by, not, by a re, not by a conference paper, not by a journal paper, but by a system that you can actually put your hands on and, and manipulate. And then there's progressive uh, development through uh, internal exploration where you, you use it to see what it will do. Uh, what they called external exploration, which is to use it for some purpose other than to help the developers understand it, and then popularization and productization. So this whole process takes on the order of 15 to 20 years, depending on uh, one thing or another. Um, and by the way, weeding out happens here. So bad ideas drop out in the earlier stages where it's less expensive to, to work with them, uh, they have to earn their, earn their stripes to, to proceed on down and, and deserve the investment of more resources to, to, uh, to get into external exploration, to, to inflict them on other people. Um, so part of this is refining the ideas, and part of this is, is filtering out the ideas that don't deserve to move on. And it being an imperfect practice uh, process, uh, sometimes, sometimes an idea gets shelved and comes back much later, but generally speaking, that's how it works. So let's look at software architecture. Uh, David Garland and I put some, uh, some dates on this, uh, beginning in 1985 and running up through um, about now. And uh, you can see that the, the stages overlap, but we tried to, 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 we tried to map software architecture in particular to the Redwine Riddle model. Since they wrote that in 1985, they couldn't look at software architecture. Okay, we had foundations. Um, we began with foundations like information hiding abstract data types, uh, objects, layered systems, model-driven approaches, system implementations, and so forth. This, this, stuff, <clears throat> this stuff all had evolved. Uh, they evolved in their own 15 to 20 year cycles. Um, evolution of this kind of thing still continues. So there's a, there's a background of, of foundations that we can draw on, not just historical foundations, but, but foundations that are emerging from, from other communities. Um, we put the basic research period as roughly 1985 to 93, um, where this is the point where you're trying to make deliberately designed structures for specific problems. So I, I remember the, uh, uh, the SEI's uh, 11th missile. It was the 11th missile, right? 
Uh, let's look at 10 instances and see if we can get a design from the 11th by abstracting from those. That was <clears throat> late 1980s. Um, we had product line architectures, uh, um, perhaps developed ad hoc, but at least product lines in companies. Um, and that was the period in which we built a, a catalog of common idioms and architectural styles by reading the narratives that people were writing about their own systems. Um, and not, by the way, about by examining their systems. We were reading their narratives because what we were interested in was the shapes in their minds, not what actually came out after they used the then current tools to, to encode those in, in a programming language. Um, and one of the things we learned was that although people looked at components, it's equally important to understand how the components interact, which is how the notion of, of connectors entered the game. So then uh, those basic models got elaborated. Uh, we did architectural description languages, formalizations that go along with them. Uh, it, it's really hard to ask people to write things down if they don't get some reward for it. And having an analysis uh, that goes with writing it down is one of the ways to give them a reward for, for doing the effort of writing it down. Um, we developed taxonomies of styles, uh, developed uh, architectural views, and the very first workshops and the first books were in that period. So moving along into the development stage, 1995 to 2000, uh, roughly, saw the second generation concepts with unification and re refinement, not just developing architecture description languages, but understanding ways to make them interoperate, uh, refining taxonomies, uh, and building a richer set of, of institutions and conference tracks and conferences. Uh, so if you look at the, at the, uh, the conference tracks and the conferences, uh, the, 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 the great flowering was, was the late 1990s. Uh, substantially overlapping with that, but extending a little later, um, was more, more explicit attention to architecture and design um, and to architecture's role in establishing uh, quality attributes, um, understanding risk, uh, understanding other qualities. And so uh, more attention to architecture and design some designs formally analyzed, uh, some, some of these analyses turning up in the design stage things that would have been expensive problems had it gone into implementation. And then the connection with, uh, with quality attributes, uh, analysis and evaluation techniques, SAM giving way to ATAM, um, and more books on practice. Um, then, <clears throat> Then it got uh, shepherded out of, the, uh, out of the house and put in the hands of other people. Um, and people started using it uh, to, to develop their own systems. So this is 1998 through, I think, still at present. Uh, we have notations, uh, frameworks, uh, ideas about component-based software engineering, and company-specific end-to-end architectures. So these are the technologies becoming useful beyond the development group itself. And then the popularization, I think, began a little bit later. Uh, but here we have production quality supported, commercialized, marketed versions of the technology uh, so that people can use it when their principal emphasis is their own projects rather than trying to find out what will make them more effective in the future. Um, there are a lot of architectural patterns that have been fueled by the development of software for the web. Uh, make your own favorite list. Uh, we have frameworks. Uh, we have platforms. Uh, we're starting to see standards, uh, standards for interfaces, uh, standards for system families. Um, the idea of the architect has evolved in ways that I personally hadn't expected it to. Uh, in many companies, the architecture is now the senior technical leader, the go-to guy for not just the architecture, but for all the other hard technical problems. Um, so it's, it's rooted in a way that I hadn't anticipated, but I think is very helpful. Um, and of course, now we have courses and conferences for practitioners and all the other, <clears throat> all the other trappings of popularization. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's the cook tour of the uh, maturation of the research discipline of software architecture. Um, and, okay, so you remember the layered system that was Unix. You remember a couple of layered systems uh, from the 80s. Uh, layered systems of various sorts as, as templates provided now in tutorials. So now we ask, um, how, are we, how are we coming on actually becoming engineering? So I 
for me, here's one of the markers. Um, it's entered the popular culture because we have cartoons about it. Um, and not only do we have cartoons about it, but we have now collections of, of components that have their own identities, that have sufficiently clear specifications that they can be composed. You can take any one of the red boxes and take out what's written down there and put in something else, and, and the system will, perhaps with some difficulty, be made to work. But, but a lot of it you can just casually, you know, you can pull out Firefox and put in Explorer and, and it'll probably work. Um, so we, we are now to this point, and I, I think this is promising on many levels, partly that the components are there and partly that, that the meme has entered popular culture. So uh, we'll take that as a marker that we're making progress. So what do we have? We have systematically organized knowledge. Uh, the SEI has produced a series of books that, that present this organized knowledge um, in a way that a practitioner can, can uh, take advantage of it. Um, we have uh, architectural styles and reasoning about them. Uh, this is uh, excerpted from a, a catalog that Paul Clements and I did uh, in 1996. And the details aren't important. What's important is that when we tabulated these things, for each of the classes of styles, we could identify a, a, a style-specific type of reasoning uh, that you would apply for that style and perhaps not to other styles. So we're refining the, the focus um, to be able to say, if you're doing data-centered repositories, you may care about the ACID properties, go think about transactions. If you're doing data flow, you're probably not thinking about transactions. And there we also uh, enumerated uh, a page or so worth of, of rules of thumb there's not formal design guidance. This doesn't rise to the level of the sorting flowchart, <coughs> but, <coughs> but it's some of the elements. It's markers that say, if your problem is like this, then consider that. Um, so we did start generating rules of thumb of this kind. Um, um, other things we know are that uh, we, we can operate in many parts of the generality and power trade-off space. Um, using generic styles and uh, generic connector types, we get a uh, low degree of specialization, that is to say a high degree of applicability, uh, but without a lot of very, without, without huge power. Um, <clears throat> so you can use generic styles practically anywhere and they will help you some, but, but they're limited. Um, and you can pick um, other points along the power, uh, the generality power trade uh, up until, up to, to saying I'm gonna have a product line for this particular application, and I'm going to gen my company is going to generate uh, the variants of our product from this product line. Uh, and here you have a great deal of power, uh, but very high specialization. Uh, if, if you're doing engine control, uh, it's not going to be very useful for database processing. Uh, so you, you, you get to choose uh, on this trade, and I think that's, that's another mark of engineering progress. Um, so we got a bunch of results. Not all of them are established scientific truths. Um, uh, Brooks, uh, quite a while ago, uh, proposed that we should recognize not just the sorts of scientific truths that we publish in, in research papers, uh, which he calls here findings, uh, but we should also respect and publish and share observations, that is, reports on actual phenomena, uh, provided they're interesting, um, and that we should be willing to share rules of thumb that may not be fully supported by data, but they're generalizations that somebody will stand up and put, my, put, put their name on, um, and you can judge them by their usefulness. Uh, they're useful not only in their own right, but they're useful as a, as a beginning of a qualitative model that you can then begin to refine. Um, so now we are at, is it engineering yet? Um, do you remember our old friend, the D bridge here? Um, I've offered you some, uh, <coughs> some tantalizing pieces of hope. Um, I remind you that engineering, the word engineering, is associated with a level of assurance uh, that protects the public health, safety, and welfare. You know, it, is, it, is, is it, it isn't engineering if I'm trying as hard as I can. It's engineering if I'm achieving at the level that this suggests. Um, and <clears throat> you look around and you see some things and then you see some other things. Consider Toyota, uh, credit card breaches, 
healthcare.gov, the Sony cyber attack last winter, uh, the TurboTax vulnerability that's been in the news for the last month. Um, and I'll look at a couple of those. Uh, the to you, you all know the Toyota case? Mm, there's some nodding of heads. Um, this is from, uh, from a colleague who was an expert witness in the case. Uh, it's from a presentation that he made that has been vetted by the lawyers. So, so I, I believe this is credible. Uh, the symptom is that the throttle gets stuck open, the driver can't stop the car. Uh, there were hundreds of people died and injured in the 2002 to 2010 models of Toyotas. Toyota de denied the claims, but after the class action suit, so that suit for something over $1.6 billion. Uh, and that, of course, caused other suits to come out of the woodwork. So what happened? Um, the, there's a computer-controlled throttle. Um, if the throttle gets stuck in wide open, the brakes won't stop the car. You cannot physically exert enough force on the brake pedal to overcome uh, the throttle. And a single bit failure could kill a critical subtask. And that critical bit failure could happen from the zapping of cosmic rays. This happens. Um, one bit failures happen not that infrequently. Usually they don't matter. Sometimes they do matter. Um, the arithmetic says that uh, uh, one that matters in, in a fleet of this size happens often enough <clears throat> for this sort of thing to happen. So what do they find under the covers? Well, the software development did not follow known good practices. There is a standard for developing software of this kind. It is not a mandatory standard in the US. Toyota said that they were using some parts of the standard. Inspection showed that they weren't exercising the parts that they said they were exercising. So there should have been a watchdog task to detect the, the death of the task that mattered. Uh, the watchdog task uh, didn't check often enough, uh, and the task didn't get restarted unless you did some things that you probably wouldn't do. Uh, they found in the code uh, cyclomatic complexity often over 50. Uh, 50 is the threshold of unmanageability. They found some modules with cyclomatic complexities of 140. Uh, they had 10,000 global variables. Um, they were using recursion in a way that could cause a stack overflow that wasn't caught, uh, and the stack would then overflow into something that mattered. Um, and poor development and testing process, and even poor compliance with what they said they were doing. Okay, this isn't engineering practice. Okay, there is an organization called the Identity Theft Resource Center that, tad that tallies data breaches. And for 2014, they found 783 data breaches exposing 85 million records. And I will tell you that's an undercount because when you look at the details uh, on this, many of the data breaches have unknown numbers of records exposed. Um, and so you know that the sum of the reported records is, is going to be an undercount. Um, they were in banking, business, education, government, military, medical, health care, um, all over the, the place. And if you, uh, if you want this kind of entertainment, you can go there and see what's happening today. Uh, this is the summary for 2014. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of data breaches. You all know about the healthcare.gov rollout. Um, uh, for those of you from outside the US, uh, we have a particularly uh, unusual healthcare system that is dysfunctional in many ways. Uh, one of the attempts to make it more functional involved uh, rolling out a website where people would go to find health care. It involved integrating um, tax records with information from different insurance companies, presumably most of which had their own ontologies, um, uh, adapting it to local regional variations and, and more. And the rollout was not successful. Um, we have as a branch of government uh, a, a government accountability office. Um, it issued this spring five reports on healthcare.gov. Um, some of them focused on the planning and oversight and some on information security and privacy. Uh, they are there public for you to read. So I said these are the characteristics of engineering. Limited uh, time, knowledge, resources, forcing decisions on trade-offs. We've certainly got that. Um, decisions shaped by the best codified knowledge available. We're not there yet. There is evidence, there are cases, there are some companies that are doing this, there are some groups that are doing this. 
but I couldn't stand up and with a straight face say, this is common practice. So, um, you know, the moon has risen, but not the sun. Um, we're not very good, I think, about making reference materials available, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, because I think we need to change the model. But I, but I think we do this in a really ad hoc way, um, and we don't systematically organize the knowledge to help shape decisions. Um, and so I think we've fallen short there. And I think we do have some areas where analysis does predict properties of the implementations, um, so, <clears throat> so there's hope there. So here's where I would put us on this, uh, this emergence map. Um, we got software development methods uh, uh, through the 90s. Uh, I say about, yeah, through uh, software development methods through the 80s, uh, around 1990, we saw widespread develop, uh, adoption of those methods. Uh, the science uh, and its merger in practice is emerging, but I think it's still spotty. So that's my fix on how far we have come. And now the question is, how will we make progress? Well, there's a huge breadth of software. And it, I wouldn't... I wouldn't even begin to suggest that we should apply the same kind of rigor to uh, helping you find a restaurant for dinner tonight that we apply to, oh, say, nuclear power plant shutdown. And in order to spread those examples out so that, that we, can, we can have a more nuanced discussion than engineer, not engineer, um, I think it's useful to, to ask, uh, uh, on, on the one hand, what happens if something goes wrong? Is it an inconvenience or is it a catastrophe? And on the other hand, how likely is it that some actual live human being is going to notice that it's going wrong and do something about it? That is to say, what degree of automation? Uh, so here are some typical tasks uh, uh, informally thrown out into that space. And I'll, I'll note that as time passes, we're tending to, to move to the right. Uh, so that we've had cruise control, um, new cars are coming out with advanced cruise control that will do speed adjustments in car following and lane following, self-driving cars are on the horizon. The consequence of failure is about the same in, in each of those cases, but the likelihood that a human's going to intervene goes down as the automation goes up. Um, and so I think that it's useful to think about the need for rigorous engineering discipline as, as intensifying as you go up into the right. Um, and the, um, the need to respond to, to other business things like market forces uh, and rapid deployment uh, as being more appropriate as you were down into the left. And, and so I, had, I advanced this as a way to, to, to separate that, that discussion. So, uh, so a couple of points about things that we should do. One is we need to recognize that the evolving technology is shaping not only our product, but the way we do business. Um, chemical engineers have Perry's handbook. It's uh, um, eight and a half by 11 by about three inches thick, and it's printed in Bible print on tissue paper. Um, chemical engineers, when they want to know something, they pick up Perry's handbook and index into it. And by the way, they know the organization because that's how the curriculum was organized. Uh, but Perry's Handbook gets issued about once every 15 years. <clears throat> That's too slow for us. Um, and not only that, but search has now come to dominate the way we acquire information. So I think we need to think through what would serve for us the purpose that Perry's Handbook serves for the chemical engineers. Um, how would we use search to supplant indexing? Um, how would we... <clears throat> How would we use it to tap into knowledge that is somehow more robust than discussion groups where other people report what they have discovered? I, you know, I, I find that kind of scary. Uh, <clears throat> but how, how, can we, how can we put material online in such a way that people can, can get it when they need it, probably relying on search rather than, than prior editing and indexing? Um, we have agility, and we have perpetual beta, um, and we have uh, <clears throat> overall monolithic design. Uh, I think we need to think more explicitly about the power and generality trade-off and how we embed knowledge in task-specific tools so that we're, we're not always being cowboys. And 
Uh, we know that high stakes applications <coughs> in the um, upper right corner have rigorous engineering. We know that mashups are fine for throwaways, but I'd like a more nuanced <coughs> discussion about what, uh, what kinds of knowledge and what kinds of rigor should be applied in between. Um, second thing we ought to do is think about architectures at scale. And I think this is probably mostly familiar, so I'll gloss over it. <coughs> but um, um, we're doing dynamically formed systems where there's nobody in charge. How do we think about those coalitions? Um, how do we balance social issues, privacy and data quality? Uh, what about the Internet of Things? And what about social technical ecosystems where the people are very much as part of <coughs> the, uh, the, the enterprise? Uh, this, this, by the way, is the, the modern version of what was called ultra large scale systems when the, when the report on that was issued a few years ago. And finally, <coughs> I really, really wish we could civilize the electronic frontier. Um, the electronic frontier is wild and woolly. Uh, but it's not uh, a safe place for the public at large. Um, when you move from a frontier to a civilization, you get infrastructures and amenities. You have civil order, good manners, <clears throat> the rule of law, uh, the empowerment of citizens to manage their own affairs, uh, clarity on issues about personal responsibility and assurance. We have not provided computing to the world at large in such a way that <clears throat> they can be comfortable here. So we need widespread understanding, not only of the technology, but also to develop shared expectations across the population at large about how it will, could, and should be used. Um, there are lots and lots of casual developers. So there's two points here. One is that if you look at the number of people who are using computing in the workplace, most of whom are uh, using spreadsheets or little databases that they have built for themselves, they're doing programming-like things, and they're not getting a whole lot of help from us. And there are lots of them. So um, our estimate of the, the recent population was 80 or 90 million in the American workplace um, of people doing programming-like things, as compared to uh, about 2.5 million highly trained professional software developers. Okay, when you're outnumbered by that much, uh, you shouldn't be trying to serve the need. You should be providing tools so that the other people can serve the need for themselves. Um, and uh, another indicator is, uh, let's see, this is from Stack Overflow. Um, they recently did a poll of Stack Overflow users. Uh, how many of you are self-taught? <clears throat> how many of you have BSs? Uh, <clears throat> huge numbers uh, of, of uh, developers in that community are not professionally trained software developers. How are we going to infuse engineering skills in the community that we're not reaching with our educational system? Uh, the Pew Foundation runs a uh, project on uh, the Internet in American Life. The point here is that everybody is an Internet user now. And they did an interesting study about what people are actually doing. Um, <coughs> the columns correspond to age groups. The intensity of color corresponds to the fraction participating. Um, and the first, uh, <coughs> first three rows are email search and health information. Everybody puts those first, second, and third. But the interesting thing is that social network use um, decreases with age. <clears throat> and let's just blow that up a little so that you can, you can see a little better. Uh, <clears throat> but as time passes, uh, the 35-year-olds uh, the are going to age into 45-year-olds, and the social network penetration is going to be much larger. Uh, so civilizing the electronic frontier uh, requires uh, policy solutions. It requires technology solutions. Um, and it Im requires improved user models, and it requires improved commitment on our part uh, to put tools in their hands that will make it possible for them to at least understand what they're doing, and even better for them to be able to, uh, to understand the need uh, to do some of the things that will make it uh, uh, useful in the long run. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the myriad people who have collaborated with me over the years. Uh, and there's a recapitulation. Um, engineering evolves from craft and commercial practice via science. Um, the uh, engineering basis that we have for ourselves involves increasingly powerful abstractions. Um, in the research community, ideas evolve over time from pure research to feed practical production. 
Uh, and when we're thinking about the application of engineering rigor, uh, we should think in a, a, a careful way about the consequences um, and degree of automation that's involved in the project as one of the ways to decide how much rigor is needed. Um, my bottom line is I think there is a substantial body of systematic knowledge that can be applied when it is appropriate, uh, but that the practice at large uh, doesn't really do so yet, uh, and we have hope. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Mary, we'd like to present you with this plaque for, and also a token of our thanks. Oh, thank you very much. So once again, oh, Mary Shaw. Yeah.